Wow, great crowd. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to, um, to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, uh, along with uh, my wife, Lisa Musc Muscatine. Uh, and it's uh, really a joy to be hosting uh, Steve Call uh, here again, uh, this time for his new book, uh, The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, the CIA, and the Origins of America's Invasion of Iraq. Uh, I've introduced Steve uh, here before for, for talks on, on some of his previous works, and uh, uh, it's, it's a bit, a bit, it's, it's a bit, a bit of, a, of a challenge coming up each time with uh, fresh superlatives uh, to describe him, uh, but uh, he does continue to deserve them. Uh, last time, six years ago, when he released uh, Director at S, uh, I extolled his prodigiousness, the clarity and incisiveness of his prose, and his ability to uh, weave together many strands into grand, richly detailed, and engrossing narratives. And all that remains true, as he's uh, proven once again in, uh, in this new book. Uh, Steve spent 20 years at the Washington Post, including time as a style features writer, financial reporter, a foreign correspondent, uh, the editor of the Sunday Magazine, and for six years, a managing editor of the paper. After leaving the Post in uh, 2005, he, he joined the New Yorker and also served five years as head of the New America Think Tank and then nine years as dean of Columbia University's journalism school. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, now he's uh, over in London uh, helping to edit The, the Economist. Uh, along the way, uh, Steve's won uh, two Pulitzers, one in 1990 for explanatory journalism and another in 2004 for his book, Ghost Wars, which recounted the CIA's history in Afghanistan from the Soviet invasion of 1979 up to, the, um, uh, to just before the 9-11 attacks. And his other books have delved into such weighty subjects as America's ill-fated involvement in Afghanistan after 9-11, the Bin Laden family, and Exxon Mobil. Uh, in The Achilles Trap, uh, which is Steve's ninth book, uh, he examines how relations between Saddam Hussein and the United States uh, went so wrong. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot has been written, of course, about the period after 9-11 and all the mistakes and miscalculations in the, in the run-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, but Steve goes back farther to uh, Saddam's assumption of power uh, in 1979 uh, and illuminates a history stretching more than two decades, uh, not just of America's missteps, but uh, of Saddam's as well. And Steve finds, as he says in the introduction, that the Iraqi leaders' uh, misunderstandings of America were as profound as America's misunderstandings of him. In researching the book, Steve was able to draw not just on interviews with key individuals and a, a range of underreported sources, but also on parts of a largely still secret trove of 2,000 hours of tape recordings of Saddam's leadership meetings. Um, Steve's per persistent efforts to access uh, these tapes is a, is a tale in itself, which um, I, I hope uh, uh, he'll talk, about, uh, talk more about in a minute. Um, anyway, his book, since its release, has received much praise for its uh, revelations, thoroughness, array of, of, of fascinating characters, starting on the first page when he bring, brings you right into uh, and introduces you to uh, 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 one of the architects of um, Iran's nuclear program, uh, and a very lively, lively narrative. Um, the lessons the book conveys are especially relevant at a time now when our you know, our current national security depends on how well we can figure out the true thinking and motivations of such present-day dangerous authoritarian leaders as Russia's uh, Putin, China's Xi, and North Korea's Kim. So please join me in welcoming uh, Steve Call. Well, thank you, Brad. Thank you all very much for coming out. Um, I was here six years ago. I was living in New York at the time, and I remember looking out at an audience like this and thinking, 
why am I living in New York? These are my people. They're all here. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, there's some Washington Post friends who are here. Of course, you may know that Brad is part of the Washington Post Mafia that kind of snakes its way through the city. There's another one. I see you. Uh, so, and I have new friends from The Economist here tonight, so it's really great to be with you. I haven't given a, like a soup to nuts talk about this book since it launched. Uh, though I've been on the road, I've always had someone asking me questions. So. I'm going to try to make this a little bit more of a Q&A and move quickly to you. When I do, <coughs> there's a microphone up here that you can line up behind. I think I, I should say uh, that you should bear in mind that we're live streaming this, so if you don't want to be identified or if somebody doesn't know you're here, um, <laughs> don't go to the microphone <laughs> is my advice. Um, so um, yeah. I. I wanted I want to just start by explaining where this book came from uh, a little bit and what its intention is. Um, it, you know, the in um, it really started in October of 2003, uh, about six months after the invasion, when I traveled to uh, I was at the Washington Post at the time, and I traveled to Baghdad with um, the late Fred Hyatt, among a couple of other people, and we met with the investigators with the Iraq survey group who had been sent over to hunt for the weapons of mass destruction that were presumed to be there. And by the time we got to them in October, they were coming to terms with the fact that there were no such weapons. And they had kind of pivoted their investigation uh, to asking why. Why are there none? Uh, and some of that answer, of course, uh, resided in the mind of Saddam Hussein, which w who was then a, a, f a fugitive. But that question um, you know, interested me for, for a, long, a long time. And even as, you know, as a nation, we, for very good reasons, had a prolonged reckoning with our, with our own failures, uh, our government's failure, the intelligence that was wrong, the selling of the war, the decisions, the planning the media's involvement in the outbreak of the war and the selling of the war, there was one big question that was never asked, which was, in addition to our failures, um, why did Saddam Hussein surrender his regime, his life, ultimately his son's lives, for the sake of weapons that he didn't possess? What was he thinking? And um, so, about uh, seven years after the invasion, I became aware that the question might be answerable because of the existence of these tapes, the, the 2,000 hours of leadership recordings that Saddam had made. They do have a tangled history. If somebody wants to ask a question about them uh, later, I'll say more. But just to give you the, the quick version, um, at the time, um, they were partially available to researchers through a center at the National Defense University. And uh, I was aware that they existed, but I didn't know much about them. And then uh, later I came back to looking for a project and still with this question kind of uh, on my list of big questions that might be worth five years of my life to try to answer, um, I discovered that they were gone, that they had been withdrawn by the United States government and were no longer available. and that. And I did some reporting, and I, I discerned that they were on a hard drive in a particular office of the Pentagon. And the person who was in charge of the safe that they were in I had a day job as a liaison to the Australian defense attache. That was as much as I learned. And so I tried to call up and say, can I have these? They were um, once public. And uh, they're not classified because, I mean, partly because they were Iraqi originated, so they they couldn't be classified in the American system um, as such, though they were sensitive and managed. Um, but anyway, uh, the answer was no. And I tried you know, the usual letter writing and other uh, naive attempts to get them. And uh, as I realized it was going to be a hard road, I was, I was at Columbia, and I had a, a colleague, an amazing journalist named Asma Khan, who was uh, working on civilian casualties in um, Mosul during the anti 
ISIS bombing campaign, and she had managed a FOIA process at the Pentagon that had ended in litigation, and she told me, oh, you should call up these people, uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. They'd help me with, with my case, and they probably would help you. And so I did that, and uh, it worked, essentially. I ended up in partnership with this uh, wonderful NGO uh, that you should all support, um, called the Reporters Committee, and they provided pro bono uh, legal support and prescient advice about how to go about things. The long and short of it is that I ended up suing uh, the Department of Defense. There is a, a case in federal court, Call versus Department of Defense. It makes me slightly <laughs> nervous that that's floating out there, but you know, it's there. Uh, and it's one of those things, like it, when we filed, I said, well, now everyone's going to know what I'm doing, because I had to say in the pleading. I was pretty far along with the research, so I wasn't really worried. I wasn't at all convinced that anybody else would be interested in spending four or five years on this. But um, the first thing that happened was I got a, an email from a guy, a PhD student at Princeton, and he said, I see that you're suing the Pentagon for these tapes. I'm obsessed with them. Uh, I wish you luck, uh, but I have scraped a bunch of stuff that used to be public and that is no more, and I'd be happy to share it with you if you want to come over to Princeton. So I then drove out to Princeton, and he handed me a he was sitting at a table outdoors in December with a copy of my last book propped up so that I would find him. And then, he, and, then he, and then he handed me a thumb drive and he said, I hope you will find this of interest. And then, uh, yeah, it was like out of a Le Carre novel. Then I took it home and opened it up and it was fantastic. It, was as, it ended up being as good as the stuff I, I got through the settlement with the Justice Department. So with those two batches, I, I went to work to try to answer this question. Now, you know, at the heart of it, of course, is Saddam himself. Um, and the person who's revealed on the tapes is a kind of confounding personality. I, I would say that, you know, they say you shouldn't write a biography of someone that you don't like. That's advice I've never taken. <laughs> uh, but, I have, but I have to say, like, I, as having written a lot about Osama bin Laden, who was a very narrow-minded and kind of dull puritanical char character. He didn't have a sense of humor. He didn't have a lot of dimension. I mean, he had talent, but um, anyway, I'd spent a lot of time writing about him and never really enjoyed being in his company. Um, Saddam, you know, was a different character. He was, he was uh, terrifying, but also charismatic. Uh, he was human in ways that were recognizable on the tapes. And he was capable of you know, remarkable prescience and he was very shrewd about the thing that was at the center of his, of his life, which was maintaining power. Um, he was quite uh, sharp at looking around corners and defeating threats before they could develop. And he understood some aspects of interstate relations and global power dynamics um, with real foresight. Um, there was a, a period right after the Berlin Wall fell where he instantly said, okay, Soviet Union is finished as a world power. Uh, Russia is going to be on its knees for a while. America is going to run roughshod in the Middle East. And uh, at some point, other powers will rise to challenge them. But get ready, this is going to be a, a, you know, a, a difficult 10 or 20 years. That was 10 years before 2003. So there were time and again, you would in the transcripts, you would come across a, a casual forecast like that and say, that, that was distinctive. But then in the next three paragraphs, he would he would be confused and talking nothing but nonsense. He, he saw the world as full of these deep structured conspiracies, all of them directed at him, uh, and many of them uh, you know, partially true or not true at all. And so he could toggle between um, clarity and confusion from paragraph to paragraph in ways that um, made it hard to kind of get a grip on what he was really thinking or what he was, what he was doing. But I did spend all these, uh, you know, years with him inside my head or, yeah, like that. And this was turned out to be a pandemic project. So uh, I was at home doing a lot of Zoom interviewing and locked in. I was, you know, we're still at Columbia, so I had lots to do. But uh, like all of us looking to kill the evenings and uh, so my wife and I rewatched The Sopranos. 
And uh, as I was like into the f second episode of the first season, they're like, okay, now I, yeah, this is, this, is, uh, this is very familiar. And so if you're trying to, yeah, just kind of imagine what he feels like on the page, Tony Soprano is not a bad place to start. Um, so then what about this central question? Why did he create this impression or how did this relationship between the United States um, become so dominated by this mirroring of misunderstanding, uh, mutually reinforcing over a long period of time? And um, it's impossible for me to provide a cogent answer to that question in you know, 10, 10 minutes, but uh, it is embedded in the narrative that opens in the book in 1979 when um, the Robert Oppenheimer of the Iraqi nuclear program uh, goes into work at the nuclear complex, a uh, British educated um, theoretical physicist, very distinguished, uh, very uh, bright, uh, somebody who I fortunately had the chance to spend time with uh, in his early 80s, still sharp as a tack, and then developed a rich correspondence with that informs the book. So he goes to work in 1979, and he's arrested at the office uh, under suspicion for being disloyal to Saddam. Uh, he's placed under house arrest, um, and he's held there for a long period of time until um, the Israeli strike on Iraqi nuclear facilities that you may recall, which took place, I believe, in June of 1980. And uh, he was still under house arrest then, and then Saddam's people came to him and said, you know, we want you to build a nuclear bomb, um, and we, we know you're the guy who can do it. And he said, well, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist, but I've never looked at any of this, and I, I'm not sure that I'm your, your guy. And they said, well, uh, think about it, because you're not leaving this, this place <laughs> until you <laughs> decide to do it. And eventually he said, okay, well, bring me some, some reading material. And they brought him uh, a library of uh, books that described the, the journey from theoretical physics to engineering at, at the Manhattan Project. And uh, where did those books come from? They were donated to Iraq by the Eisenhower administration <laughs> as part of the Adams for Peace program. So anyway, uh, we start there and we, and we roll into the 1980s. And I'll just give you, um, before we turn to your questions, maybe just a, a handful of kind of interventions in this long, complicated narrative. Because the book starts in 1979, and the real answer to why uh, this unfolded from Saddam's point of view is, I'm afraid, it's embedded in the narrative. As, the, as this very kind uh, a New York T Times reviewer uh, noted, at about 500 pages, it's short for a call book. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's breezy, I promise you. It has a lot of humor, various uh, uh, Arab proverbs, all kinds of little uh, things. But anyway, um, I'll give you just a flavor of some of the, both the episodes and then the thematic kind of structural confusion that arose from them. First in the 1980s. Um, originally I was going to start the book in, at Safwan at the ceasefire ceremony in, uh, at the end of the first Gulf War um, and, and then go through the 90s. But in an early interview, one of the people who had worked on the investigation into why this had happened, said, no, you got to do the 80s. And then I went back and looked and realized that that was true, which meant a lot more work. But I'll tell you why it's so fundamental. Um, so uh, Saddam, without provocation, invaded Iran and started a, a war uh, in uh, September of 1980, 81, 80. Uh, and he did this because the Iranian Revolution, led by Ayatollah Khomeini, threatened him. Khomeini, of course, was hostile to his secular nationalist outlook, but also coveted uh, influence in Iraq, and said, I'm going to drive to Baghdad, and I'm going to hang Saddam from the nearest uh, light post. And Saddam thought that the revolution was in such turmoil that he could uh, basically break it up, topple uh, Khomeini before he could consolidate power, and so that was 
that's giving him a little bit of credit for having a plan, but anyway, he invaded uh, opportunistically, uh, having been informed that there was opportunity in Tehran uh, to, to break up the, the politics there. Of course, we all know he failed, he got bogged down, miscalculated in all kinds of ways militarily. Uh, the Reagan administration is watching this, uh, spin the clock forward. In June of 1982, they see through satellite photography that uh, not only is Saddam not going to achieve his objectives in Iran, but the Iranians are about to break through Iraqi lines and make a drive on Baghdad, and that they might be a week or two away from fulfilling Khomeini's pledge to overthrow Saddam and extend the influence of the Iranian revolution. And so they sent a uh, CIA officer, a guy named Tom Twetton. Some of you might have run into him around town. Um, he's still around as a bookseller in Vermont. Uh, he ended up running the whole clandestine service later in his career. They sent him into Baghdad uh, on a private jet loaned by King Hussein, uh, carrying satellite photographs of Iranian positions. And he met with Saddam's people and said, you know, we're here to help you avoid losing the war that you started, uh, and here are some, some photographs. And that began a liaison, uh, uh, a tilt towards Iraq that was delivered in the form of this unique intelligence that helped the Iraqis identify Iranian positions to target Iranian positions, eventually to use chemical weapons against Iranian positions, but also to avoid uh, you know, to patch up the, the, the holes in their lines that had first caused the Reagan administration to panic. Now, throughout this cooperation, which lasted until 1988, um, in one form or another, Saddam was very suspicious about this. I mean, he would, you know, on the tapes, he's always saying to his comrades, you know, I think these photos are doctored. I think they're, they're designed to lure us into an ambush. And his generals would say, in effect, well, we can look over the mountain, and the things that it shows are there, they're really there, and then when we attack them, that is good for us. So it would be nice to keep this stuff coming. And he would reluctantly say, all right, we'll keep it coming, but I, there's something wrong with this picture. And the, uh, his other hypothesis was, they're giving the same photos to the Iranians uh, to, re to basically foment a stalemate. Then around 1985, his intelligence service started to collect information about the Iranians getting a hold of spare parts and weapons from Israeli sources. And he starts to report to his comrades, you know, the Americans must know about this. I've been telling you, we're being double-crossed. This is not what it seems. And they're all like, yeah, boss. But still, the pictures are accurate. They're very helpful. Um, and then in November 1986, at a press conference on television with the then Attorney General Edmund, Edwin Meese, what is, what is effectively in, announced? Anybody remember those dates? Yeah, what well, the scandal that became known as Iran-Contra was announced. And there's this <laughs> wonderful set of tapes from the first day after, the second day after this, where Saddam is with his comrades. And he's basically, everybody in the Arab world is shocked that the United States could do this. The, you'll recall that what the United States did, uh, the Reagan administration, uh, accepted an invitation from Israel to supply arms uh, and to provide intelligence to the Iranians uh, for their war against Iraq in the hope that the Iranians would uh, then release hostages um, being held by Iranian proxy, proxies in Lebanon. That was the, the hypothesis. And it didn't work, uh, but when it was exposed, it became a huge scandal in the United States and in the Arab world. And the, the one world leader who was not surprised, as you'll see on these tapes, is Saddam. And he's like, I told you, I told you all along. Uh, and, you know, he's a raging anti-Semite. And absolutely, you know, even by whatever measure you would put things on a scale, he was, uh, you know, absolutely racist and, and uncompromising in his views. And, and that's part of his reaction to, to this revelation. But the reason it matters is, it confirmed him in his conviction that what he really faced throughout this period with, of trying to figure out how to manage the United States was a, um, 
a deeply embedded conspiracy that involved the U.S. collaborating with Israel and Ayatollah Khomeini. In his judgment, Ayatollah Khomeini had been installed by the United States for the very purpose of, of containing him, Saddam, and that this was a, a joint project of the U.S. and Israel. What's interesting about it is you get to the 90s when we're trying to disarm him and we're getting into these conflicts about whether or not he has WMD, whether he's cooperating with inspectors, and there are whole other tapes where he's talking with his colleagues about whether he should be cooperating or how he should be reading American intentions or actions, and he'll say the answer was revealed in November 1986. Friends, you may not remember, but I remember that is the permanent state of affairs. So these, uh, this idea that I think we would probably find consensus about that, however well-intentioned, thinking about the hostages, that Iran-Contra represented a strain of, you know, sort of harebrained incompetence in American foreign policy that recurs from time to time, like that was not part of his worldview. And he couldn't, if, he, if you had made that argument to him, he would have thrown you out. Um, so I'll skip over the Gulf War, although I will say for those of you who lived in the Foreign Service and remember uh, the politics around that invasion, and particularly the failure of the H.W. Bush administration to deter Saddam from going into Kuwait. I, there, I've gone back over all of that um, in some, I hope, uh, readable depth to, um, and one of the kind of, just calling balls and strikes, but one of the results of it is that tried to exonerate April Glaspie, who you may remember as the, as the uh, female ambassador in uh, Baghdad who had a meeting with Saddam and it was later thrown under the bus by the Bush administration as the whole reason that the Kuwait war happened. And it uh, is completely uh, insupportable and, and ridiculous. And there are two things that we can see now. One, uh, that he had decided to loot and occupy Kuwait long before that meeting. He'd done it in secret and all of his diplomacy was just smokescreen to get to D-Day. Uh, but also that everything she said to him was written for her by the White House and she professionally just read out. If anybody uh, gave you know, inadequate signals to Saddam, it was the, the administration that she was serving. She didn't freelance a single sentence in there. So anyway, uh, that's a kind of Washington story, I suppose, but uh, one I was glad to spend time with. But to get to the kind of core matter in the 1990s, even I, who had a vague idea of what Saddam had done, based on what we learned after 2003, was sort of surprised at how um, inexplicable his conduct was after the Kuwait War. So you recall he was invades Kuwait, he's expelled from Kuwait, uh, and then uh, the UN implements these harsh disarmament requirements on Iraq, uh, basically says to him, you must disarm yourself of all of your chemical weapon stocks, all of your biological weapon stocks, any nuclear program you have, missiles that can travel a certain distance, and all of the dual-use infrastructure and all of the intellectual property associated with it. You've got to come clean about everything and give it to us. And so as the first inspectors are coming in, he tells his son-in-law to get rid of all of the weapons that are still around, chemical weapons and the missiles that are of a prohibited range. And you have this image of uh, Hussein Kamal was his name, going out into the desert in the night uh, and taking trucks with them with large stocks of, of weapons and just dumping them into the sand. And did they take any photographs of this? No. Did they keep an inventory of what they were destroying? No. Did they have any records of even where this stuff had come from, when it had been manufactured, how it fit into the larger history of manufacturing? No. They just did it, and then they proceeded to lie about it. Uh, they said, well, we never really had it, or we had it, but it, we destroyed it, just like you said. And this went on for a while, and it was the seed of the confusion that led directly to the, to the bad estimates about what was still uh, in Iraq. And it's hard to explain uh, why he handled it that way. But he didn't want to get caught. Uh, he didn't want to be humiliated. 
Uh, he feared that if he allowed th this disarmament to take place in, in sight of his enemies, Iran, Israel, that they would see him as vulnerable and move against him. He thought his own generals might do the same. Um, but his decision to simultaneously comply with international demands and then to deceive everyone about what he had done, including his own generals, you can imagine the cascade, the snowball of confusion that then unfolds in the narrative over the next years from that original decision. And um, that's a lot of what the second part of the, of the book is about. Um, you know, he concluded that honesty wouldn't pay. And so at points when he had an opportunity to cooperate, he would tell his comrades on these tapes, look, if we do that, they're not going to give us sanctions relief. You people are naive. You think that they mean what they say, that if we cooperate, they'll open up our economy and allow us to sell oil again. That's not true. They're determined to, um, you know, to weaken Iraq. And anyway, the CIA already knows that we don't have any of these weapons. Uh, and if you believe that the CIA is omniscient and that they know the truth of what he did in the dark of night in 1991, then the logic is that the accusations or the questioning and the relentless inspections is all just a game. It's just a pressure game. Why should I play their game? Uh, and so I can either have my dignity and my sovereignty and, and kind of continue to stay in power without submitting to that. Uh, or I can submit to it, but the result will be the same, so why should I submit to it? That's what he, and his, there's this dialogue with his, especially his diplomats are saying, well, boss, you know, it wouldn't hurt to go to the UN and maybe uh, give them a bone, or, uh, and he's always arguing against that for these, more or less the reasons I've just described. And then, of course, finally, toward the end of the Clinton administration, uh, in 1997, Madeleine Albright made a speech at Georgetown in which she said, uh, what he had always been telling his comrades, which is our policy is that it doesn't matter if he disarms, we're not going to uh, relieve him of sanctions, relieve Iraq of sanctions until he's gone. So it more or less confirmed what he had been telling everyone for, for three or four years. And it, once again, he said, you know, see, you, you people don't really understand how the world works. I get how the world works. Uh, and, uh, and then the last kind of little taste of it, I'm rushing through these very svelte 500 pages here to give you uh, some examples. But, um, you know, there's one of the things I concentrated on in my FOIA case uh, was tapes and, and other materials from the period between 9 11 and 2003, because the stuff that had been out there earlier was kind of heavily weighted towards earlier periods. Um, and, and I wondered what is there. I still wonder what's there, because not, I didn't get everything um, by any means. But um, one of the things that emerges from this last period when we are revving up uh, to invade is that he is not the same person that he was uh, when he invaded Iran and when he invaded Kuwait. I mean, he's in his 60s now, and he's become uh, much less interested in military affairs. He's much more isolated physically because he's afraid of assassination even more acutely than in earlier periods of his life. And he's become obsessed with novel writing. Uh, he wrote four novels in a very short period of time. I interviewed one of his editors, uh, and he would basically spend hours and hours writing in longhand in Arabic uh, these you know, chapters of his novels. And then he would send them to his editors. And at first he said, OK, correct my grammar, send it back. And so they would dutifully comply. and he would not accept any of their changes. <laughs> he would send it back and say, print it. And at a certain point, they said, maybe it's a wiser policy just not to correct his grammar. Uh, and so they didn't. They basically printed what he wrote. And, but he was spending hours and hours on these novels. And so he was very slow, one of which he turned into a, like a 20-part television miniseries uh, and, and a musical. Uh, <laughs> And he didn't, you know, he got excellent reviews in Baghdad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it just, you know, when we had this idea inflamed by 9 11 that he represented this living 
threat who was bent on reconstitution of his weapons programs and who, and who uh, was very actively kind of waking up uh, connected to plots to follow on 9-11 a week in the United States, he was in a very different place. And, and he was so slow to recognize what was coming. He, would, he missed that he would be vulnerable to accusations for his own responsibility uh, for 9-11 because he, he, he didn't have any ties to al-Qaeda. And that one really surprised him, and he was slow to get it. Uh, and then on the WMD, he's like, okay, haven't we been over all this ground? I mean, you've been making these accusations for the same reasons for a long time. He didn't think that the United States had the appetite to take casualties in a ground invasion. And, uh, and so he was very slow to, to get, he never really prepared for the invasion. Uh, the one measure of his, of his obliviousness was he had, I think, like a billion dollars in cash in the central bank in downtown Baghdad. And there was a question that came up, kind of late 2002, uh, you know, boss, should we, should we move this money uh, so that, because the Americans are going to come in and take it. And uh, so he formed a committee, appointed his son, like, okay, make a plan to box the money up so we can move it if we want. And then every few weeks they'd come back and say, are you ready to move it, disperse it, like hide it? And he's like, mm, I don't think they're coming. I really don't. All the way until about a four weeks before the invasion, he finally said, okay, get the trucks over there, get it out of the way. And at that point he had no preparations. Um, I'll just end by explaining the title. Um, there's two reasons why the book is called The Achilles Trap. The real one is that it just sounded like one of those great Star Trek episodes that I liked, <laughs> you know, where the ship goes out and they, there's like some mythical figure standing in front of a planet blocking them. Like, yeah, so I just like the ring of it, but um, the, the justification after that kind of gut call, like I want to call this book The Achilles Trap, is there a reason that I can? And the answer is, uh, yeah. Um, actually, both the United States and Saddam uh, used that, that myth as a way to explain uh, why their enemy was vulnerable in some way that turned out to be misguided. In the U.S. case, there was a long covert action program that is chronicled in the book to try to foment a coup against Saddam, and it was, its communications were coded DB Achilles, looking for that one colonel who would get in and, and knock him out and solve all of our problems. And then, Saddam would always would give these remarks in which he said, you know, the United States looks like the world's only superpower, but in fact it has an, an, all great powers have an Achilles heel, and the Achilles heel of the Americans is that they, they won't take casualties in war. Uh, that proved to be also, from our perspective, tragically, uh, a miscalculation as well. So uh, thank you very much for gathering and listening, and I'm happy to take some questions. Remember, you're on TV. Hi. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cole. First of all, for providing this much-needed diversion from our preoccupation with the former president who's trying to become president again. And uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Gulf War number two, as you have uh, described, was from all accounts in, in a long list of American foreign policy failures in the way it was executed by Bush the Jr. I just want to draw a contrast and ask your opinion with Gulf War number one, which his father executed in a very different way. You had Dick Cheney, the arch villain of Gulf War II, was the defense secretary in Gulf War I. And they went about it in a very organized manner, got the mandate from the UN, put together a coalition. And from all accounts, it was a well-executed war. What do you think made accounts for differences between the way that was executed and the way the Gulf War II was? Yeah, well, I mean, you have the author of two books about that question sitting here just over to your right. So, um, but, I mean, the short version is allies, war aims, uh, war aims aligned with means, planning, um, and, a, and a willingness to uh, you know, even in the chaos and, and all of the, inevitably, even in the first Gulf War, you know, the plans were met with, you know, by the enemy and, and adjustments had to be required 
uh, but in the end, the kind of Powell doctrine was the framing of the plan, and the president executed it and stopped um, after it's the war ends that the coalition had signed up for had been achieved. So that was true of the first war, and none of that was really true of the of the second war. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Wesley Clark famously said that uh, seven countries were going to be falling, starting with Iraq and then eventually Iran. And uh, do you think this had something to do with ultimately what happened to Iraq? And what do you think is going to happen with Iran? Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask that question to. I should say that this book kind of runs from the opening that I described up until March of 2003, when the president, uh, when when George W. Bush announces the invasion of Iraq, so it's not a book about the Iraq War that followed. Um, but um, you know, I think the the one thing I would pick up there is the continuity of um, how, from the Reagan administration right through to today, the you know some of American eyesight about um, Iraq was informed by the knowledge that if Iraq cracked up, and uh, that Iran would ex exploit the vacuum. And, and of course, that is probably the biggest through line from 2003 until today. It's still going on, um, you know, and it's part of the headlines that the Biden administration is dealing with today. Um, thank you. And my question is, um, before Iraq invaded Iran, why did the United States not find it in their interest to help Iraq defeat Iran, especially um, in the sense that like, Arab, the Arab nation state movement uh, pushing against um, a religious non-secular movement um, would eventually collapse in Iran, would take fill the power in the Middle East eventually. Why did the United States not find it in their interest to help Iraq well, sooner? I mean, we had it. We had our hands full in uh, Iran, the hostage crisis, and uh, you know the failed uh, rescue attempt. And so, um, by the time uh, Saddam decided to act, uh, we had learned the hard way that the revolution looked um, intractable, and that the search for some kind of sort of ally within the revolution or um, some strategy of a quick fix was a fool's errand. So I think um, the Reagan administration meant what it said at the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, which was that it thought that there was no victory, military victory achievable by either side, that it didn't want to intensify the war by selling weapons to either side, and that its principal interest was the free flow of oil through the Gulf and the protection of our uh, Gulf allies, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Bahrain, et cetera, for traditional reasons of the energy economy, and that the conflict between Iran and Iraq threatened those core interests and the stability of the world economy and the price of oil. So that was, I think, where they started, and then the prospect of an Iranian victory emerged, and they responded to that. So I, I think that was this, that's the sequence. So it, it sounds like this, this question actually takes place after your book ends, but uh, do you know, after the fall of Baghdad, uh, was Saddam, when he was in hiding, was he protected by regime loyalists? Uh, and did he have any influence over the insurgency that started? Yeah, it's a good question. It is in the epilogue. <laughs> so it's within the, uh, yeah. I mean, he, he did have influence over the insurgency. Um, he, he followed a trail that was part of his own self-mythologizing uh, biography from an earlier time in his life. Because you know he, he grew up as a, as a sort of gunman in the Ba'ath Party um, in, in the period of Nasserism and pan-Arab nationalism. And he came of age um, at a time of violent political instability in Baghdad after the overthrow of the royal family in 1958. There were a series of conflicts and coups on the streets of Baghdad. 
And his role coming into the Ba'ath Party was basically an assassin. He committed his first murder back into Crete when he was probably about 15, 16, a kind of a family feud. And then later, in an ambush that they attempted against um, the prevailing strongman at the time, he was in the four or five uh, sc numbered squad that uh, stood on Al Al Rashid Street and tried to hit the car that as it went by. So that was his, um, his kind of coming of age. And at one point, he was imprisoned, and he escaped. And when he escaped, he had this dramatic journey. Uh, involved a horse. It involved swimming across a river. It involved going to this particular area of Tikrit where he had grown up and, uh, and hiding there. And so after the, in, the invasion, he more or less followed that same pathway. And when he was found, he was found in the same area where he had, had hidden when he was in his mm, 20s, maybe, yeah. And uh, so from there, he was communicating by courier. Uh, there's a very interesting set of records. When he finally does start to pay attention in the last couple of months before the invasion, there's a very interesting set of records where he's making remarks to his some of his generals, uh, some of his Ba'ath Party loyalists, people who he expects to, to be the guerrilla movement. And he's, he's basically saying, uh, you know, you're going to have to communicate in small groups. You're going to have to hide in the shadows. You're going to have to plan ambushes. My advice to you, and you can hear him kind of thinking about his own youth as an assassin, like he's romanticizing. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. You should learn how to ride a motorcycle. Uh, you should jet around and shoot at people. You should learn how to ride horses, he says that uh, at one point. And, and he's like, and I'll be in touch. And, and one of the reasons that, that his own generals were confused about this was he would, he would repeatedly say in these couple of months, just hold them for a week or two, and then I'll, I'll take care of it. Uh, and they all thought, well, that means he's got some like nuclear weapon or something. What's he going to do after a week or two? He's got something. He's got a secret weapon. And uh, yeah, throughout there, there was a great deal of uncertainty among his own generals, which is by his design, because anybody who had a tank or a helicopter or an aircraft that could drop bombs on his palace, he didn't trust. And so he deliberately confused them about what his own capacity might be. But anyway, that's where he was. Uh, it was a, a journey drawn from his own memory, and he was attempting to, to manage the insurgency, but it was... Uh, there was a command structure. There were four Ba'ath loyalists who were given control of different places, and it held up for you know, a month or two, and then I think it gradually dissolved before he was captured in, in December. Do you think it would have made a difference if General Powell had declined to support the war? <laughs> yeah, it might have. I mean, I, I'm not a big, you know, believer in counterfactual history because it's just too many ways that you could rerun the tape. But um, I guess if you were to ask, would, would any person of influence in a position to um, dissent have changed the politics uh, in, in this country or elsewhere, he would have been the person who, who would have had the best chance to do that. I just think that you know, it seems consistent with his profile in the country at the time, as well as his record as a commander and as a diplomat and his, and his service to the country and in the Bush administration. So if he had decided to do something like that, yeah, I think it would have, it would have been influential. How influential? I have no idea. Uh, two observations or questions. I uh, worked at the CIA on nuclear proliferation from the 70s through the 90s. Um, the first observation or question is, um, it was an open secret that the Pakistanis had a pretty robust nuclear weapons program. And in your two previous books, you don't deal with that hardly at all. But uh, Ronald Reagan was known to have said, nuclear proliferation is none of our business. And during that decade, if you're thinking about where was Saddam's mind, which uh, you may know from the tapes, he had to know that the United States uh, subordinated the nonproliferation policy to 
getting arms through Pakistan to tie down the Mujahideen. So we made a, uh, Congress made uh, findings and exemptions of our laws so that we could supply uh, weapons to the Mujahideen through Pakistan and ignore their weapons program. Saddam must have, everybody must have been aware of that in Iraq, and it would be, be interesting to know how that might have influenced his thinking that, well, they'll never really push me on a nuclear issue. The other question is uh, the uh, Washington Post reviewer of your book talks about your contextualization of the intelligence issue at that time. Uh, my sense is after the uh, reactor was bombed by the Israelis, th there was really no there there, nothing really advanced like knowing having uranium enrichment, enriched uranium plutonium, and that I had read, although I wasn't at the agency at that time, that Dick Cheney and Scooter Libby went out to the agency many times to get the kind of NIE or intelligence they needed to justify Condi Rice talking about a mushroom cloud. Um, I assume you deal with that issue, but there's also the question of where was Saddam's thinking about is the U.S. really serious about nuclear proliferation? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a lot there. Um, I, I'd say we we signaled um, our willingness to overlook his use of weapons of mass destruction in a more simple way, which was during the time that he was gassing Iranian troops and his own Kurdish population in plain sight, and we slapped him on the wrist and and said that we objected to his violation of norms, but he used more sarin and mustard than anybody since the First World War, and we didn't withdraw economic cooperation or intelligence cooperation as a result. So he had plenty of signaling from us about our permissiveness. On the Pakistanis, it's interesting because, um, you know, of course, he had a fairly racist attitude towards South Asians, and he was dismissive of the Pakistanis, but it irritated him that the Pakistanis and the Indians already had a bomb, and he didn't, and it was part of his kind of drive for prestige. There is a moment in 1990, after he invades Kuwait, when A.Q. Khan writes him a letter, uh, actually writes, uh, yeah, writes to Saddam directly and says, I've got some stuff if you want to, you know, if you want to speed up your bomb. Really? And for sale, yeah. And he passes it to Jafar Dia Jafar, this uh, Oppenheimer figure that I mentioned earlier, and he reviews it and says, uh, this looks like a trap to me. Like, wow. I think this is a, this is a, a, and anyway, we don't need their help. We've got, we got it. Uh, and so there were, there were contacts. There was certainly awareness. The, some of the scientists um, uh, would refer to Pakistan's success as an explanation to Saddam about why this was achievable on an indigenous basis. So, thank you. Hi, how are you? Um, my first question, what is the holdup on the U.S. government keeping Saddam's regime's files still, I mean, they're not classified, but they are still, yeah. there's still a lot available out there, I'm guessing, that is, has not been reported on. Yeah, there's a ton. There's a ton of materials that Have are Have they given a reason, yet. or? I mean, there, I'm not aware of an on-the-record fulsome explanation. Uh, what I have discerned from different kind of conversations with people, uh, mostly indirectly, is that in the Biden administration, there was a willingness to consider this. Stanford has come to them a couple of times and said, look, we'll take these off your hands. We will, we will, uh, manage their upkeep and the expense of curating them, as well as access. We'll, we'll provide access. We can negotiate how that would work. Um, we'll take care of it. We've got it. And they still haven't been able to um, reach an agreement. There are obstacles that were managed in the earlier period when they were available about personally identifiable information of ordinary Iraqis that are in the files that could be used by sectarians to carry out violent attacks today. That's a serious issue, but that's not, uh, that, that's manageable um, and is managed with similar records elsewhere. Um, there are other questions that I understand lawyers have gotten involved with about, you know, restrictions on giving things of value to universities. And, and I, I think there's just not a sense of urgency or political will. And uh, I find the whole thing slightly mysterious. Thank you. 
And then my second question, this is just really particular. I finished your book yesterday. Oh, nice. OK. All right, well, you get the second question if you finish the book. OK. <laughs> it's amazing. Everybody should. <laughs> Anybody else who's finished the book, just come on up and stand behind the microphone. I just Get in front of Dana. That's fine. <laughs> uh, my only question was, um, it was a Tony Blair quote at the end that I haven't seen it written anywhere. Attempts to secure nuclear capability and, as seems possible, add on the Al-Qaeda link, which it would be highly persuasive over here. I haven't seen that reported on before or written about? Was that in the Chilcot report? Yeah, a lot of that was in Chilcot. I mean, if, 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 you, if you are really interested in the period from 9-11 to 2003, even from the American perspective, I, I was really flummoxed about how to do anything fresh with the U.S. side from 9-11 to 2003. I felt like I had kind of strategies that I could do in the 80s and the 90s, but but you know they've been so well reported and researched and documented, and what could I really add? And um, I think the answer is not a s ton of new material. But one thing I did was I went through the Chilcot report. Anybody know what the Chilcot report is? This is like this massive British investigation, uh, an investigation on a scale that our government never undertook. Um, I hesitate to say uh, on accountable television exactly how many pages it is, but it's many, many thousands of pages. And uh, fortunately, I was at Columbia, and I had the ability to recruit graduate students to help me go through it and to skip over the parts that I wasn't interested in and get to the parts. That, but what's so, what's so fascinating about it, if you're, you know, if you were an American PhD student, I would advise you to, to look at it because there are the Brits had access to the Bush administration, right? They were meet, they were traveling over here and going into meetings at every level of government throughout the run-up to war. They were the essential political ally and a valued military partner. And so they, different parts of the British establishment were meeting with different par their counterparts across the U.S. administration. And what were they doing? They were writing memos about the conversations they had and cables. And, they, and all of that ends up in Chilcot. So if you go back, you have this side door view of a bunch of conversations with uh, Condoleezza Rice, with Colin Powell, with the Pentagon, uh, with CENTCOM that are not in the record. As, as, as impressive as our investigative reporting was here, th there's a whole bunch of new. And the timeline gets really clarified as to exactly when uh, things were decided. And I know that a lot of people, even participants you know, uh, at the State Department, will say, like, I still don't quite understand how that happened. All right, well, there is definitely, the lens gets a little bit more in focus when you go through the Chilcot chronology. And, and so I try to use that. So I put a lot of quotations in there that were new to me and that I thought, most people wouldn't notice them, but thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, both of my questions relate to the media. And really, since I haven't read your book yet, they also relate to, um, uh, well, the first one, to today. So did you, understanding the enemy gets to be almost a taboo when you're in the middle of a big national campaign against an enemy. So today we are more or less in a campaign against Putin and Hamas. And it, did you learn anything in doing the book that, we, that could inform our journalism and our effort to find out things about our enemies before we go to war that might add to the body of knowledge that may um, you know, push war down the road or prevent war or, or not, just. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I thought about that mostly because I figured I would be asked questions like that when I got out on the road. And, and it was really fascinating to reflect on because they were not questions I would have thought about so much before. But my feeling was, I, maybe I should have felt differently about it, but I felt entirely empowered I, or given permission to empathize with Saddam without sanitizing him. That was kind of my intention, was like, I wanted to get completely inside his head and see the world from behind his eyes. And I didn't, it's morally uncomfortable at times, because figuring out how to 
write about him in full and not sanitize him, but also to understand him and to give him a little bit of life as a human being, that's a writer's task. But I, I mean, that's what writers do, right? So I think the first answer to your question is I don't see an obstacle to journalists uh, attempting to get inside uh, the, a movement, leadership, intentions, backstory. Um, I would think that would be like a sense, you would have a sense of mission about doing that. Now, you would think, but you never see that happen. Well, it's hard work. I mean, obviously, you don't have the tapes in real time. Uh, but I mean, Hamas is not a hard target. Right. Putin, uh, would be Putin is a lot harder. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope he's recording, because I don't know that I'll be around to read it. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, because I'm sure that as, as much as um, you know, technical intelligence accurately predicted the invasion of Ukraine, um, I feel sure that you know, the first principle of the Saddam case study and many others like it is humility. Like whatever you think you know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot that matters that is just not available. So um, how will we ever sort of get that part of uh, of uh, Putin's story, I, I, you know, if David Hoffman's around, he'll he'll get it eventually. But um, uh, it's, it's yeah. So I, that's so that's okay. your first question. So my second question is, you were the managing editor of the Post um, in the run up to the war, and the Post did its little, you know, it wasn't elaborate, but it did sort of a mea culpa, um, a review of why certain coverage was the way it is. Did you reassess that for yourself as you were going through here? I don't know, maybe it's in the book as a juxtaposition between what's really happening and what's being portrayed as happening in the media? I mean, I, I, I didn't do a self-examination or a Washington Post kind of sidebar mm -hmm. in the book. Um, so no, I didn't. I mean, what did I see? Um, I saw that the, you know, the opportunity to report about the intelligence about the nuclear program in particular was a huge missed opportunity. Like there was definitely, I mean, Knight Ritter was right. uh, praised for getting that for good reason because it was gettable. There was like a, the whole aluminum tubes thing was a fiasco. And it was, it was like a, there was a little bit of an open door. The nuclear file was almost closed in 2003. I mean, Hans Blix, the IAEA director who then ran mm -hmm. UNMOVIC, of the three, of the four categories, if you go back and just read what the UN was publishing to the Security Council, like that was the one where they were saying, you know, we're almost done with this. And so the opportunity to just read the files and juxtapose that with public rhetoric that would have been the easiest one. I think mm -hmm. chemical weapons would have been the hardest. Biological was tough because, you know, you don't need any space to make things, and there was a lot of uncertainty in the file. That was where Saddam lied the most over the longest period of time and left the most confusion. So I think on WMD, that would be, um, but I always felt then and, and later that, you know, there was an opportunity to do way better on some of the nuclear uh, and WMD reporting. It was certainly an opportunity to call Chalabi out. I think we did that better than a lot of people. But um, then there was the opportunity to think about the war itself and the planning and the assumptions about mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the liberation of Iraq. And, and that, there is no obstacle to doing better on that. So that really is more about your first question. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the the uh, the society, the the party, the military, the um, communities fractured in the South and in the North that we will actually encounter. I mean, we should have done more about it, that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Want to sign some books, Steve? I'll sign some books. Yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs>